Amen. Church, take your Bible in hand, please, and open it with me to the back of your New Testament, to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Saved in Christmas hope. Christmas hope. When you find 1 Peter chapter 1, stand with me. I want to ask us to look at a couple, three verses as we begin. And we're going to preach down through uh, 13 through 21 in just a moment. If you will look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Begin to look at verse 13. Read it with me off the monitor. We're going to read verse 13, the beginning verse, and verse 21, the ending verse. And you'll notice hope in both of those. Read verse 13 and 21 with me. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, who through Him believe in God, who raised Him from the dead, and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Faith and hope. Now, Father, this morning as we stand, Lord, by faith in the blood of Your Son to save us and make us righteous in Him and through Him and by Him, we have a hope and an expectation of your goodness every day, your presence every day. But Father, that great hope and expectation of the fullness of our redemption yet to come at Christ's return for His church. Father, this morning we pray your Holy Spirit would teach us from your word the blessedness of hope, the value of hope. Lord, the message of hope to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated if you would. Like faith, the word hope has gotten um, uh, a world's definition of hope, like it has its definition of faith. Uh, last week we talked about some people see faith as a belief in the impractical. Hope to the world is just uh, hoping without expectation. John Paul Sartre used to say that... Uh, he, he, he was a great atheist. He denied God. And he said, I know I shall die in hope. And he would say that over and over to himself. He confided that when he would think about death as he got older, he would say to himself, I will die in hope. I will die in hope. But then the idea would come to him, hope has to have a foundation. Hope is not just empty hoping, like I hope and there's no foundation for it. I hope this or I hope that. The biblical word hope is tied to faith, as we see in the verse 21 of our text, that in faith we have in God, our faith in Christ Jesus, a hope and expectation that is based on everything of who God is and all that God has said. There's a lot of little ways that that's uh, experienced in our life. My, one of my grandsons told his daddy, uh, this past week that he knew when he came to granddaddy's and nana's for Christmas he was going to get some money. He was going to get some money. Now, there's a foundation for that. Every time he's come for Christmas to my house, he's got money. So it's not just hoping in the dark. It is a hope based on what he knows and has come to believe is true. This morning as we Begin our text. Peter begins the chapter about how it is we've come to know Christ. In verse 2 of chapter 1, Peter says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience unto the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. Peter refers to the triune activity of God in our redemption. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. God working His redemptive plan for us and to us. And he says that we have received, according to His abundant mercy, a living hope 
through the resurrection. Our hope is based on an empty tomb. That Christ is not dead. He's alive. He was he's arisen from the grave. And a living Christ is alive and He's coming for us. And He's translating us from life earthly to life eternal. Whether we go to Him in death or He comes for us in the rapture, we have an expectation that cannot be shaken because forever our hope is settled in Christ Jesus. But as we get over to verse 13, all, off of that hope comes then practical encouragement, practical exhortation for us. And Paul, uh, Peter, I'm sorry, unpacks about four or five things about hope that I want us to look at in these verses. In verse 13, if you want to fill out the outline, let's talk for a moment about hope's expectation. I'm sorry, anticipation. Hope is a matter of anticipating. It's it's expecting something. If we've already experienced it, we're not hoping for it, we're experiencing it. There's those things in the Christian life I am already experiencing in the redemption. God, I am already re experiencing forgiveness of my sin. The blessedness of a right relationship to the Father through the blood of Christ. But there is yet a fullness of that to be experienced that I've not yet experienced. I still have a sin nature. I'm in expectation looking forward to that glorification when the sin nature is forever done away with. And I, without any hindrance of the flesh, the world, and the devil, am able to be His fully and totally unhindered and unmolested. Amen. What a hope. What an expectation. But there is that anticipation. Uh, I love that about Christmas, isn't it? We, we start talking early. The children start talking about uh, how many more days of Christmas, Daddy? How many more days? How many? We anticipate that something great is going to happen, that, that there's something good that we're looking forward to, and we anticipate it because we know. And hope gives us that biblical-based anticipation. Think for a moment with me about in our verse, in verse 13, a couple of things he says. He talks about our readiness. He says, therefore, because of the hope we have in Christ, on the basis, our hope has a basis and a foundation, and is Christ's risen, living redemption. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace. He talks for a moment about our readiness. Look at those words. Gird up the loins of your mind. Now that's that's funny talk to us. Gird up the loins of your mind. Maybe you've got another translation that says make ready, make, uh, make preparations. The idea of girding up your loins. Men in the Middle East walked in, normally walked in robes that flowed down to their feet. And they had a rope belt around them. When they got ready to run or they were going to be in battle or they needed to run or walk fast, they would take the rope and they would put the rope between their legs and they would tie the rope up and make what I say would look like britches. And they could run without being tripped or hindered. They girded up the loins. They girded up that which would cause them potential to trip and fall. Get ready when they girded up themselves. That means I'm getting ready for either to run or to battle, whatever's before me. I'm readying myself. He says, look, gird up what? The loins of your mind. I don't know how many times I've said it, if you won't think Christian, you can't possibly live Christian. The Christian life is won or lost in your thought life. And hope, the expectation that we have in the resurrection of Christ Jesus, gives us a hope that in our mind is a settled matter. It is as settled as anything can be. In the resurrection of Christ, I have a mind made up that I can expect everything. My hope and expectation is lends to an anticipation of everything that God has promised to me and for me. Prepare your minds for living in a day. We, our world doesn't give much basis for hope, does it? Disease, evil, sickness, all, all, the inhumanity, all this done. I thought about it as we sang the song, Peace on Earth. Now we would love for that to be peace all over the earth. That everybody on the earth would be living in peace. All those uh, Miss Universe contestants, I just wish for world peace. I just wish for world peace. Well, world peace is coming. But not the way this world wants it to come. This world wants it to come without God's sovereign reign. 
But there is peace on earth today. It's on the earth. It's available. The Lord Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is here. He's available to, to, to receive, be received and enter the hearts and lives of everyone who receive Him. Hope is here today. We, there is a basis for hope. Even in a world that's fallen and depraved and broken, there is in Christ Jesus in us. We know in our own thoughts, in our own mind, we come to the Word of God and we are convinced there is still every reason for me as a child of God to be expectant and have anticipation about the favor and goodness of God. No matter what happens, all things work together for those, for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. But no matter what comes into my life, my hope says, anticipate God's blessing. Anticipate God working it for your good. Not that everything's good, but that God, a good God can turn it for my good, ultimately and eventually. So he talks about our readiness. Gird up. Be sober. Be sober. Don't, don't imbibe the Kool-Aid of the world. Uh, one of the hardest things, I believe, that Christians have to grow out of as new babes in Christ is trying to get God's things the world's way. We, we want to keep walking in a world system, a world way, and try to get a godly result. The things of the world never accomplish the will of God. But he says, look, don't, get, off of the, get off of the wine of the world. Get, get, sober up. The word sober literally means uh, not to be staggering. Why are so many Christians, even in their faith in Christ, staggering through their lives, staggering through the world, falling often, and, and, and seem to have no steadiness? Because they've not made their mind up about who they are in Christ Jesus, who God is in their life, place Him as sovereign, preeminent God of their life, and walk in Him in the fullness of surrender that the Christian life calls us to. Well, not only the readiness, look, he, talks, he uses the word rest. And rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. Now Christ has already brought grace to us, right? He brought grace to us when He came at His first advent. But the Bible talks about a second advent, a second coming of Christ. So He has brought to us a hope in redemption. But we know there is even a greater experience in Him, a greater fullness of redemption that's yet ahead for me in glorification. And he says, in that advent, in that coming of Christ, we are going to rest our hope fully upon grace. What's your hope resting on? Resting on how you perform? Uh, I, I, man, I'm going to try to do good. I hope I don't misstep. And God zap me and, and I lose all hope. That somehow God is going to take all this hope away from me because I didn't perform to perfection. What a miserable way to try to go through life trying to get the world's way, what you can only have in God's way. We rest our hope on His grace. On His grace. God, You, in Christ Jesus, have provided for me. So he says, get ready, gird up the loins of your mind, and then rest your hope on the grace that's coming at the revelation, we're going to see that word again, of Christ. Well, not only hope's anticipation, verse 14, he talks about hope's transformation. We talked last week about a faith that transforms. Hope also has a transformative effect on the life of God's people. Because I'm living in a blessed hope. No matter what the world, no matter how broken, no matter how bad the world may be, or how rough and tough circumstances may be, I have a hope in Christ Jesus that is not based upon circumstances, based upon His grace. And because of that, the events of the world, the circumstances of my day, cannot touch hope unless I allow the enemy to steal, kill, or destroy what God has provided by grace in hope. So hope has a transformative effect. It can change and will change my life. Look at verse 14. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. Now look at those words. Every word full of instruction and help for us who walk in hope. Notice first of all, as obedient children. The Father's children. As obedient children. Notice that we obey... We walk in hope 
in obedience. Hope says my obedience to God is the surest way I know to have an expectation and an anticipation of God's goodness. So, Brother Tony, how, how, how do I get to live the best life this life has to offer? What is the best life this life has to offer? The best life this life has to offer is a life that's found meaning and purpose and hope by faith in Jesus Christ. By Christ coming in and bringing us from spiritual death to spiritual life. Then that life is lived in obedience. The best life you can have in living in these days is a life that's lived in obedience to God because it's in that obedience to Him we're living out faith and we're living out hope. I can anticipate, I can expect in my obedience God to be pleased with me. I I don't obey to perfection. I miss it. I, I, I misled. I stumble. I trip. But even when I do, I have a hope and a faith that says, when I confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I cannot think of a more bipolar thought than to think that I am going to disobey God and His Word and still walk in His favor and blessing. Now, that statement is far-reaching, church. Because see, we have some of our pet things that we have set aside obedience to with a sigh of conscience. It may be things like worship and intimacy with God through prayer and His Word. Oh, well, you know, I'm just busy. When I retire, man, I'm going to stay in the Word about 23 hours a day. And we, we walk through life Missing. But we do it without thought. The Word of God says, They who have received my Spirit will be witnesses unto me. We never speak a witness for Christ, but yet in our mind we have the idea that I'm okay with God, everything's right with God. I can anticipate and expect the favor of God, though I am blatantly disobeying Him in a part of what God intends to be my everyday life. I mentioned giving earlier. There's those who and they go after, they go after wealth of this world. And they disobey every biblical principle of God, whether it's tithe or whether it's uh, holding all things loosely, being, uh, being uh, used of God to bless others. They, they, they disobey every biblical principle, even though the warnings of God are there. Paul says, Timothy, warn those that are rich not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. I love what Hosea the prophet says. He says, there's those who rob God of what's His. They put it in a bag trying to store it up. And it says, God cuts a hole in the bottom of the bag. (laughs) You can't hide it away from me. You're mine, which makes it mine. All of you is mine. And when I obey God, I can expect the favor of God. Now, I don't give to get. I give to worship and to love and to praise. But in that obedience, there is an anticipation, an expectation. There is a transformation. But notice, he says, obedient children, number two, he talks about our former conformity. Not conforming yourself to the former lust as in your ignorance. Now let's deal with that last phrase first, as in your ignorance. The word ignorance doesn't mean unable to learn. It means untaught. There was a time in my life where I was ignorant to the grace and goodness of God. Nobody ever told me. I think about the Christian people that I I didn't have many, but I had some Christian people around me. The Hayes family I mentioned from time to time. I still correspond with Scott, my my dear friend. His mama, Miss Pat, could have led me to Jesus, I believe, any day she wanted. I loved her uh, as like my own mother. She was a Christian woman. She prayed. She went to church. But you know... In all of my life, she never one time told me about Jesus and how I could be saved. Now, I have no doubt that she prayed hard for me because I was running buddy with her son. (laughs) I'm sure she prayed hard for me that I'd not take her boy astray, which is a real probability. But I was ignorant of the grace of God. But then one day, through the preaching of the gospel, I learned and the grace and the goodness of God in Christ Jesus was made known to me. 
And in that newness of understanding, I found in Christ through His grace a redemption. And he says, we are not to be conformed to that former lust. He uses that word to talk about that that desire of living that is completely worldly and that was completely contrary to the things of God. I, I never as a lost man woke up and thought, man, I want to go out today and do what pleases God. Every day of our life lost apart from Christ is lived in and to ourselves. He says, do not be conformed. We are familiar with that word. We preached through the book of Romans this summer. We got to chapter 12 and it says, be not conformed to this word, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a, it's a familiar word. It's a, it's a, it's a picturesque word. Uh, as we look at the, the idea of the word, it's syschematizo. We hear the word schematic in that. A schematic is a diagram of how things are wired, of how it goes together, how things flow and how they work. What he's saying is, look, don't live like you're wired to the world. Don't be wired to the world. Don't be shaped and put into a mold by outward pressure to conform and look like the world. Our goal as God's people is never to look like a lost world looks. You couldn't tell that by the way some churches go about ministry. I had a dear friend who surrendered to ministry. And the next time I saw him, I, I didn't recognize him. He had changed his physical appearance every way imaginable. And I said, Steve, is that you? He said, yeah. I said, he said, I did this so I could look like the people I'm trying to reach. Now, you thought the people he's trying to reach looked like that because they, need, they had God and didn't need? Or were they searching for something and looking for something, trying to get some kind of acceptance, trying to get some kind of, a, a, some kind of acknowledgement? apart from the things of Christ. The church growth movement, I believe, got derailed mightily over the idea of looking like the world we're trying to reach, sounding like the world. The preacher that cussed in the pulpit, uh, often, and when he finally, his people finally said, we can't stand anymore, he said, how can you dare? How, that's how people talk, and I'm just talking like they talk. You weren't saved to talk like they talk. You were saved to talk the way God changes you and transforms your life. Let no uh, bad communications, no vile communication come out of your mouth. Only that which is to the edifying of the people of God. I'm not saved to look like, talk like, act like, be schematic to the world. I am wired new and I'm wired to heaven. Be seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. That's where our identity is and comes from. Live like who we are. Number three in verse 15 and 16, hope's proclamation. Hope proclaims to us who we are and what we're like. It's a powerful verse that's quoted and a reminder as Peter uh, writes to this, these uh, uh, people who are have been very um, uh, hurt and abused in great tribulation and great trouble. Look at verse 15. But as He who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, your Bible may say, be holy for I am holy, and that's, that's, that's fine. But it can also just as accurately be translated by the tense, you will be holy, for I am holy. You will be holy, for I am holy. The sense is the same, isn't it? Be holy, it's in the imperative. Think about that with me for just a moment. Notice the reasoning. He says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Now, isn't that, doesn't, doesn't it make sense? If God who is holy has called me from a sinful world and He has redeemed me by the blood of His Son, He has sanctified me, He has made me set apart, and the righteousness of Christ abides in me, that a holy God saved me to Himself to be like Him. And so it makes sense. God doesn't save me out of holiness into holiness for me not to live holy. So he says then, when he uses that phrase, he says, uh, in all your conduct, in all your conduct, it's the word for just your manner of life, in all that you do. 
uh, it doesn't conduct doesn't limit itself to what I do outwardly. Conduct includes my mental thought life, my attitudes, my emotions. It, it, it obviously it includes my words as well as my walk. So listen, God saved all of us, all of all of me. He saved all of you. And God saved us into holiness. I don't think there's much argument anymore today, but there was a time when it was discussed what the defining attribute of God is. Some argued it was love. It was love. In the 60s, that was a big thing. God is love. You see, in the 60s, we did that thing of a being verb. Uh, Tony is daddy. Daddy is Tony. It, it works both ways. If it's true, it's said one way. It's true when it's said the other way. So the way uh, the, the 60s wanted to say it was, God is love. And you say it backwards, love is God. No. The angels around the eternal throne of God are not antithetically singing back and forth to one another. Love, love, love. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. God's love is a holy love. God's grace is a holy grace. God's mercy is a holy mercy. Everything, holiness defines and sets parameters to everything of who God is and what God does and even how God does it. The reasoning, we're called from and to. We're not left where we are. Turn just about three or four pages to the right to the book of 1 John in the third chapter. And look, listen with me at these first three verses. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. doesn't mean it doesn't know your name. It means it doesn't understand you. We talked about that last week. Verse 2, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed fully what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in himself and purifies himself just as He is pure. The hope that we have in Christ is a transforming hope to a holiness a holiness in God. Sometimes the cloak of holiness seems too heavy. And we say things like, well, you know, nobody's perfect. And the enemy gets us to a place where we begin to downgrade the idea of my personal holiness as mattering to God. And he wants me to downgrade holiness as an unachievable, un. Uh, uh, something I can't possibly ascribe to this side of heaven. And so uh, it's okay not to even aspire to strive and go after it. And that's the deception of the enemy. I have no illusion or delusion that I'm going to achieve holiness this side of glory. But I know this. The holiness of Jesus lives in me. And I am to pursue that holiness by crucifying the flesh by bringing thoughts into captivity into conformity to Christ and I am to every day to pursue with a righteous pursuit that which is put in me to live out to work out that which Christ has put in I love to say it this way I know when Christ appears I'm going to be changed from here from earth to glory I'm going to be changed it's going to happen but what is my goal my goal is to live my life day by day in such a way that when that day comes, the change can be as minimal as possible because that change is already being happening in the living of these days. There is in us that rationale of holiness. Look at verse 14. I'm sorry, the rest of the verse. Our, our relationship, uh, the, the next part of the verse says, uh, verse 16, you will be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. A relationship. The rationale and the relationship. I was born of God to bear seed. Peter puts it this way in the second letter he writes in the first chapter in verse 4. By which we have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. Sounds good so far, right? 
we've been given great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That when the Holy Spirit comes in, my relationship with the Father through grace in Christ Jesus means that I have now become a partaker of that divine nature. Not, I'm not God, but I have the holiness of Christ imparted, implanted in me in saving faith. And that I'm to live that out. Well, verses 17 through 19 talks about hope's transaction. Hope's transaction. Verse 17. It says, If you call on the Father with who, without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here, in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot, without blemish and without spot. Think about that one for just a moment. He begins that phrase, that section, with a condition. Did you catch it? It's the word if, that in the original language, it's the word henna, I-N-A, and it's called a henna clause. It's, it's a clause of potential. It's a clause of potential. It's a clause that sets um, conditions. He says, if it's true of you, you call him Father. Now, if that's not true, what he's about to say doesn't apply to you. If you say, no, 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 I've never accepted Christ as Savior in order of my life. I, I've never come to the Father through the blood of the Son. I've never been redeemed and born again by the Spirit of God into God's family. That's not me. Then Peter's not talking to you. But if that's your testimony, if the condition if you call on Him as Father, you know the character of the Father, that He's holy. You know that. And He says that He judges without partiality. Now think about that for a moment. Some people allow the enemy to interpret grace like this. Because there's grace, I don't have to worry anymore about uh, displeasing God because by grace, He just overlooks it. Grace doesn't look at God's favor and goodness and say, I'm not concerned. He says, listen, you know that a holy God without partiality, look, look, you see the word? Look at the word. He judges according to one's work. Now, there's two ways the word judge is used. One is the idea of krena, of a criminal court. There's a judge sitting there to, to pronounce you guilty or innocent. That's not the use. The other is the idea of the judges that sit beside the pool at the Olympic diving pool and each one goes off the board and they are assessed and they are judged to where they'll stand on the awards ladder. The only difference in God's limit, we all will be rewarded. We'll, we're all going to have a place on the Bema that stand that, we're, that people stand on to receive awards. But God accurately, without partiality, He assesses a life according to our conduct. Now, you see, some people have the idea that because of God's grace, I no longer have to worry about how I live my life. Now, the word fear here, again, there is that debilitating fear, and there is the idea of fear that is a seriousness and an earnestness about the weightiness of it. Daniel Webster, if you know history, was considered one of the greatest minds in American life. He gave us our Webster's Dictionary. One day, a man asked the great Daniel Webster, he said, Mr. Webster, what would you say is the greatest thought that ever passed through your mind? History says that without reservation or hesitation, he answered the question like this, my accountability to God. That one day, I'm going to stand before holy God. Freed by the blood of His Son from a life of sin and slavery to the ability to live pleasing and holy. And I'm going to stand one day and I'm going to give an account to God. He said, it is the heaviest thought that's ever passed, most profound thought that's ever passed through my mind. I one day, would you think about that for about half a second and let it impact you this morning? One day, yes, by grace, I'm going to stand before God saved from my sin, yet I'm still going to be assessed 
by a holy God who judges without partiality. I hear it all the time. People are disobeyed and they say, yeah, but uh, you see, but here, here's the thing. I, I, I'm going to explain to God. You see, when I, when I get a minute, I'm going to, I mean, when I explain to God, God's going to understand why it was okay for me not to do what God said I was supposed to. Can you think of a more silly? I don't even call that ignorant. I call that stupid. That's just dumb. You're going you're gonna to inform God about something He don't know. And you're going to show Him how your disobedience to Him was rational and right. He's going to judge us without partiality for the life we've lived. And He's called us to be holy. And we have in hope the transaction if it is our condition that we call Him His Father. Notice why all of that makes perfect sense when we consider the cost, the transaction of hope. What did it cost for us to be people of hope? Look at verse 18 and 19. Knowing, what do we know? That you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like what? Like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers. Verse 19, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Verse 18, Knowing you were not redeemed with the corruptible things. Verse 19, With the precious blood of Christ. The cost, not corruptible stuff. I don't know how to fix you. This, this thought and the thoughts like these is what has have dogged my thinking for years. It challenges me continually to be a better man, that I, have, that I have not aspired yet to the fullness of Christ's redemption in me. That if Jesus died for me to have it, if Jesus shed blood was shed for me to be it, if He paid that for me to have it, with what tenacity should I be pursuing the holiness that He placed in me when He saved me? I wasn't redeemed with just money, silver and gold. A far, far greater cost was that transaction than that. The very blood of Christ Himself was paid for us. How grateful would she, would, would, should we be? And what greater way is there to express gratitude for the blood of Christ than obedience to Him? Obedience to Him. Well, verse 20, 21, hope's manifestation and we're done. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifesting in these last times for you. Let's stop there and talk about God's plan in verse 20. Uh, we see Christmas in this verse. He says that He, Christ, indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days. Now, uh, Christmas is a time where the deity of Christ is on great display. In the 1800s and in the 40s, uh, there were those who weren't linguists who came out, well, you see, there's just a misapplication of the translation. It doesn't say He is God. It says He was a God, kind of a God. That there is God who's God and in Christ is something lesser. And they insist on that. And somehow they claim it has to do with uh, the Scriptures and a misapplying of the Scriptures. Let me give this illustration real quick because you need to have it. Let's say that uh, you're in court. You're a bystander and you're listening to the court. And uh, there's ten people that are called a witness. And out of the ten, nine people said the blue car hit the white car. One witness said the white car hit the blue car. Nine said blue to white. One said white to blue. When the jury comes back and finds the blue car guilty, is that not just? Is one out of nine reasonable doubt? Well, no, no. I mean, it makes sense that if nine saw it, that is an overwhelming weighty evidence that it happened that way. Well, let's say, what if the witnesses numbered in the hundreds? Let's say there was a hundred who came. And 99 said the blue hit the white, and one said the white hit the blue. You say, well, no, that, that's still, uh, there's no reasonable doubt there. There's, there's no reasonable doubt. How about if the number was thousands? We have copies 
of the New Testament, over a thousand that date into the first century. Now, what does that matter? It means they're close to the autographs. Just, just to make that point, nobody doubts that William Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. Nobody doubts what, that, what his original autograph said. But you know, the time from the time he penned it to the time the first copy was made, you know how much time passed? 320 some odd years. Nobody doubts it. Well, imagine if somebody made a copy within the first 50 to 60 years. We have the, there is never, there is nowhere in any of the copies, in any of the manuscripts that we have in extent still today where the wording is ever doubted. Those misapplications of the deity of Christ. In John 17, Jesus talks about the glory I have with you before the foundation of the world. Christ, there's always said, but Brother Tony, there's one God essence, I get that, and there's three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but there's one God essence, there's one God. But how does He exist that way? I don't know. All I know is that God has revealed Himself as a triune God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. That's how God says it. In Genesis 1-1, when God said, let us make man in our own image, He wasn't talking to Himself. There is, a, there is a triune existence of the Father God that includes the Son and the Spirit. Jesus was before there was any creation. Christ is not a part of the created order. Not like an angelic host. The angelic host weren't created with a body. They weren't created redeemable. If He was created as a man, then if He died sinless, He'd have no extra redemption for you or me. He would have just done what He's supposed to have done. But Isaac, Abraham nailed it when he said to Isaac, the Father himself shall provide the sacrifice. Emmanuel, God with us, is no lie. The deity of Christ is an inseparable part of Christmas. Otherwise, if he's not the God-man, divine and human, then he couldn't save you. Oh yeah, you see, I, 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 I'm, crucif- I, I'm saved by His example. He said we're saved by sinless blood. Any man born of Adam has sinless blood. Well, but God came on Mary in a way, uh, He did. He gave the eternal Christ the physical body that He still lives in today, glorified physical body that He still exists in today and will for the rest of eternity forward like we will when we're glorified. But He says, before the foundation of the world, it was God's plan. Foreordained means that God had the plan ahead of time. And if and when man sins, God's foreknowledge wasn't caused. If God's foreknowledge didn't make Adam sin, but God who looks at the first day of time and the last day of time equally clear because He created time and matter, He foreordained that if and when Adam sins, I've got a plan. wouldn't have been like we'd done it, planned it, would it? We wouldn't have done it that way. But God did. Notice, in these manifest to us in these last times, Paul says in Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son to be born of the Virgin. At Christmas was about a fullness of time. When God said, before there was a, anything, before I spoke anything into existence that we call creation. Christ was already foreordained to be. And that we saw that that time chronos clicked off second after second, minute after minute. One page of the calendar turned, one year turned after the other. And finally there come a time in the fullness of God's foreordained plan when God said, now go. And in the virgin's womb he came and was born. His plan He would come, like verses 21, that the power of God, who through Him, Christ, through Christ we believe in God, who raised Him from the dead, there is again, is the promise of the resurrection and the power and importance of the resurrection in our hope, and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Our faith in Christ is in God's eternal plan, that through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, God's plan of redemption was enacted by the Spirit of God. We are drawn, and we are convicted of our sin, and when we repent of our sin and surrender our life to God, it is the Spirit of God who comes in and brings us from death to life, and we become partakers of the divine nature. 
the triune work of God and our redemption is a part of our hope that's manifest for us. Well, verse 13, we saw it said, rest your hope on grace. In verse 21, it says, through faith we have hope in God. Hope. What a time of expectation and hope Christmas is. My first year's pastor, I was in Oklahoma, it snowed up there. and Being a southern boy and not getting to have very many white Christmas, man, it was just special. But I'd become pastor in June or July, and, and that Christmas was there. And man, I was supposed to stand and preach. And as I began to get through all of that, I, I just kept being overwhelmed by all of what it meant. And the little thought came to my mind in a whole new way. Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was truly white as snow. Born unlike all the rest, not born to live, but to die for us. Well, some applications that are general but important, and we're done. Our redemption through a resurrected Lord is the basis for our hope. In this sinful world, our hope says this. Number one, get your mind right. Gird up the loins of your mind. Don't let the lostness and the brokenness of the world we live in steal, rob, or kill the joy and the anticipation of God's goodness in and through you. Secondly, don't go back to an old conformity. It's in a hopelessness that we surrender back to a, a sinful life as though we have no option. Hope says don't give up. Don't quit. Keep pursuing the holiness that God saved you in and for. Live in that new nature of holiness. May that be for you a profound thought. That God without partiality, one day I'll stand before Him and He will assess my conduct against the backdrop of the holiness He saved me for and to. Number four, I said already, but let godly fear motivate us to live worthy of Christ's blood. And number five, rest our hope on the sure foundation of God's redemption and grace. Hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, the whole hymn says. He is our blessed hope. We live every day, every moment, in an expectation and an anticipation of hope that is buttressed on faith of who Christ is and what He's done and the love that God has bestowed upon us in His grace. Maybe this morning, when I said the condition is, if you call Him Father, you knew that wasn't you. You couldn't honestly say that's you. I've, I've never done that. I've never, oh, I believe there's a God, but I've never placed my faith and trust in Christ. Matter of fact, I, I, don't, I don't know if I accept the deity of Christ. Am I theological opinion if he's not divine he can't save you and if in your mind he's something other than the God man I don't know who or what saved you I don't know who or what your hope is buttressed to not to the revelation that God has given us about his son and who he is maybe this morning you need to come and say God I want to surrender all I am to you through the blood of your Son, receiving the holiness that comes in Him as I'm redeemed and saved. And now I have an eternal hope, an anticipation and an expectation of the fullness of the redemption that's being made available to me. Maybe this morning there's other decisions that Christ has placed on your heart. Maybe other decisions this week that you've made, but this morning the Spirit of God is saying it need to be made public. Whatever the decision is this morning, it's the anticipation, the expectation that if I obey, that's all I got to do. If I obey, God will bless. God will favor. God, God will build up. God will be pleased because obedience is Jesus' definition of love when he said to his disciples, if you love me, obey me. Obedience is our highest expression of love. And it's in that obedience we 
Give him out of hope and faith and anticipation of pleasing him and honoring him with our lives. Stand with me if you would. We're going to have a word of prayer, and after that, the altar is open. The opportunity to respond is here, and you do that as the Lord leads and guides.